Okay, so welcome everyone and thanks a lot for uh, joining this session. It's absolutely uh, a great pleasure to connect with so many uh, developers around, the, around PyTorch. Uh, my name is Gianmarco Iodice. I'm the um, uh, Gen AI Software Engineering Lead at ARM. And today I'm going to talk about how, how ARM is enabling AI everywhere. And in this session, I'm going to unpack the, the meaning of, of this title. So together we're going to see what it means actually everywhere. We're going to talk about a bit of AI. We're going also to talk about what I'm um, offered in terms of uh, products in order to accelerate AI. But I also want to add another important keyword that we're gonna also hear quite a lot in this presentation. We want to enable AI in a very non-intrusive way to developers. Um, so let's kick off this presentation. I'm gonna uh, talk a bit uh, about uh, myself as well because I also like to reflect on uh, the, the challenges that are in front of us by also talking about the challenges that we have faced until now because a AI actually is um, is something not completely new. It's actually um, already deployed in, in tons of devices out there. And I have been lucky, uh, very lucky to work on AI since the, uh, at the very beginning of my journey. Um, when we started to deploy in 2014 the first um, applications on mobile powered by, uh, by AI. I'm talking about the first Alex and models or the VGG16 models. And my background is around the software optimizations to enable that. And guess what? These optimizations were running on an ARM CPUs already in 2014. Um, I have been uh, um, around and behind the creation of some um, software products at ARM. Uh, one quite recent uh, behind the ARM Clyde uh, AI. And we're gonna hear a lot um, today about the, uh, this, uh, this project, but also behind the creation of the ARM Compute Library in 2017. I'm also a developer, and I care a lot about uh, what, um, what it means about um, the, um, what I said before about non-intrusive way. So we want to enable something, but very simple to everyone. And that is also the reason I wrote a book two years ago because I'm also a, um, a person that believes a lot on, in open source contribution and I wanted to give something back to the, to the community because I have learned and I'm learning still a lot from, from them. So, and I wrote the Tiny ML Cookbook which is uh, uh, something about machine learning on uh, low power devices like microcontrollers. In the title, I mentioned everywhere. So what everywhere means here? So in order to uh, understand what everywhere means, uh, I'd like to talk a bit about ARM. So ARM is a company that designs processors. So, and maybe the first question you might have in mind is, how many ARM-based chips have you shipped so far worldwide? Over 300 billion ARM-based chips have been shipped at, um, worldwide until now. So, but this number actually does not answer the, the original question everywhere. To answer this question, we need to understand where we are in the, in the market segments. And we can certainly say that we are on, in the 99% of the mobile phones out there, the ARM CPU, and in the 100% of the leading cloud service providers because they, prov they provide also an ARM-based service. But what is very important for us is this number. The number of software developers, which are also ARM experts, and I want to, to stress this point because actually this is also the motivation behind one of the product that we have, the, uh, we have released recently, Clyde AI. So over 20 million developers are experimenting, innovating on ARM. So probably you can understand from this slide how pervasive is this technology, okay? Because it's in the hands of everyone. And at ARM we have an important role. 
and the role is, well, this technology is everywhere. Every developer can use it. So we need to make sure that they can get the best performance. Best performance when we have a new freeze, a new structure, a new uh, AI capability from day one, okay? But when I say performance, it's not just about latency, because sometimes we just talk about performance in terms of um, a latency performance. Here, I'm also talking about power efficiency, for instance. And this presentation will also expand a bit about on, on the meaning and the importance to have very efficient uh, computation. However, this goal is probably not enough because we can enable the, um, the best performance in many ways, many, many ways. What we want is also to enable this in a non-intrusive way, what I said at the very beginning. We want developers to keep uh, innovating. We don't want to put frictions in during in-day development workflow. We want them to unlock the uh, creativity with software because creativity for sure fuels innovation. And this is what we have seen with Gen AI. Gen AI is, is certainly driven by the hardware capabilities, but also by the possibility given by the software programmability. So, and until this point, probably you, you cannot understand also the, the important role of software for ARM. And this is, a, this is actually, some, these are some numbers to uh, stress this point, because for ARM, ARM is investing, has been investing quite a lot in a software, in the software ecosystem in the last 15 years. 40% of the ARM's people are dedicated to software projects. Software projects, which are in many cases also open source projects, like Cloud AI, for instance, like the Compute Library, and many more. But not solo projects, in many cases, are also collaboration with companies and also software developers. So, after this introduction, and uh, after uh, talking about everywhere, what it means everywhere, and the pervasiveness of this technology. I want to talk about the AI, and I'm going to look at back uh, when I started at ARM um, 10 years ago, where we were deploying the first um, AI applications with AlexNet for doing image classification, object detection. Uh, it was a very uh, interesting time uh, to join the company because uh, certainly having something running on mobile at that time for doing such a complicated task was absolutely fascinating. Bef because of deep learning, but before deep learning we had other techniques. In this slide, um, I have split what we have seen until now, see, the sensory, because most of the, um, the applications we have seen before were tightly coupled to sensors. And with sensors, I mean the camera, for instance, or the microphone, or the accelerometer to detect or recognize some spe a specific motion. Let's think about the smartwatch, for instance. But nowadays, we are seeing something different. We are moving from sensory to creativity. And it's absolutely incredible and fascinating. Because now, users can, can use AI to generate new content, can generate text, can generate images, can generate audio, video. And certainly by looking at what we can do now and what we have done in the past, we can also try to predict the future. That I'm not going to talk a lot, but a future probably based on reasoning capabilities in AI models. Challenges. Well, we have in front of us opportunities, but with the opportunities, we certainly have challenges. Some of these challenges are not very new because some of them are actually, we have already faced and we have already solved in 2014 when we had the first wave of deep learning models. 
At that time, we had VGG16, Inception V3, which we consider big models. Well, probably nowadays are considered tiny, considered the size of Gen AI models. So the memory constraint is certainly an important challenge. But we have also other, other challenges because we have this technology that is evolving because of view. Um, but we have challenges in terms of physical factor because maybe we want to have this technology in devices which, are, which have, we also have physical constraints, for instance. Let's think about the smartwatch. Let's think about the smart, glass, the smart glasses as well. And there are challenges or new challenges that probably now are very important concerning the data. Because it's true, I mean, data, it, was, it, was, it is what it makes or breaks your model. But these new Gen AI models can also have a continuous learning because some of the use cases can be, um, can be personalized, okay, or better. Uh, some of these uh, use cases um, can be very useful for user to uh, behave like the user wants. I give a very simple example. So a chatbot that replies in, in, the, in how the user wants or with the, with the tone or, um, or there are other, other uses like images, like generating images in the style that the user wants. And of course, there are some uh, interesting uh, aspects to consider about the privacy uh, and so on. But what does it mean? We have plenty of challenges, and probably we can also understand that it does not exist a single solution that fits them all. Single solution means a single device, and with all means all the applications in the world. And that is the reason why ARM can help, because ARM is everywhere, from cloud to edge. So um, it is certainly something to, to consider, uh, because it makes the life easier to developers. And what it means making the life easier to developers, it looks like uh, a marketing message. It's not. Actually, it's a reality. And this is something we have also demonstrated. So it means that. Um, the code that you write, for instance, on mobile, can run well also in the cloud. And here we are not talking about code portability. Here we are talking about performance portability, which is crucial when you need to think about the deployability of an application from cloud to edge. So who decides what device to, um, to use? is the application. The application is actually what it drives the, cell, the adoption of a specific device. And the developers, they have the option to deploy in the cloud, on mobile, or at the very edge. So now let's talk about use cases. Um, so yesterday there were some interesting presentations. They presented some use cases in the context of Gen AI. Um, so I'm gonna uh, keep it uh, brief for um, today, and because we are going to uh, see very interesting and new use cases with Gen AI, which are, for instance, related to messaging apps. Okay, so we might see Gen AI to uh, summarize uh, a group chat conversation. We wrote an interesting blog post recently where we describe some of these use cases. Or we might use Gen AI to summarize e emails or to write emails. These will be complementary, of course, to traditional uh, AI use cases, for instance, for image classification or for applying filters to images or for speech recognition. So all of these will live together. But a new class of models is also um, emerging emerging not just in the cloud, but also mobile. And these are the multi-model models. Models that are capable to solve different tasks with a single model. So the model that can consume different inputs, video and text, or image and text, and can provide uh, useful information. We have seen yesterday a very interesting presentation from the Executors team 
that provided a, a use case on mobile for, uh, for having um, a multimodal model that is capable also to describe the content of an image. It's, it's very, very cool. But when we talk about use cases, most of the time we think about the future. And it's not the case for, for this, um, uh, for us, sorry. And what I'm trying to say here is the fact that we don't need to wait next year, two years, because we don't have the capabilities. These run today, from cloud to edge. And we have demonstrated um, already to our developers with our demos and with collaborations with, for instance, with framework developers. And this is an example, um, uh, sorry, uh, this is an example of um, a demo that we have also at our booth, uh, where we have the um, uh, chatbot in the cloud power on, on the Gravity machine running using uh, the, uh, the PyTorch framework. What about mobile? Well, in the last six months, we have developed so many demos in collaboration also with our partners, which are absolutely amazing. I mean, I have been in this field for 10 years, as I said, and some of these use cases I could not imagine two years ago. And I'm talking about what we have on the right-hand side, and we also have the demo here, which is the real-time voice assistant running fully locally on the ARM CPU without internet connection on a device which is two years old. This is on today's technology. So this means that tomorrow's device can only be better or be more powerful as well. On the left-hand side, there is a chatbot. Also, this demo is at our booth, so it's, it's the usual uh, large language model that is used to, uh, to reply to queries. At the center and the top, it's very, a very cool use case it's for games. Uh, there is a, a user that interacts with voice and asks to the character to perform specific tasks. And this is performed with a large language model, and so the, and we, and we Gen AI, so it's, it's a very good combination of graphics and uh, AI to have a user interaction with character with voice. So it's quite cool. What do we have at the bottom is a language model running on the microcontroller using the micro MP. And this is absolutely another incredible thing. I mean, if you are familiar with, probably with the microcontroller or the embedded space, you know that you probably don't have a lot of memory, okay? This runs today and not tomorrow. <laughs> Interesting, interesting use cases. What can we say about power? And here, uh, I like to use a, um, an example just to, related to LLMs, so Gen AI, but in the context of LLM. Because power, power consumption is absolutely a factor to consider. So if you factor all these elements together, you can probably figure out that the amount of power needed is quite a lot. So how do we solve this problem? Because here we have an average of four billion people using AI with the assumption that can, each one can make 1,000 inference per day, quite reasonable, I would say. Um, that each inference can generate maybe on average 2,000 tokens probably more, I would say. Um, and each token takes 250 tokens. And the computing platform has um, one uh, tops per watt. So I don't want to go into details of the math, but absolutely, if you start some, you know, multiplying all these values together, the values goes higher and higher and higher. So how do we solve this problem? Or how, what do we propose to solve this problem? There are two ways. Well, the first is, as I said before, we need to think about cloud to edge fully, 
okay? When we believe that an application can run well on mobile, let's run it on mobile. But if there are other, other, other parts of the pipeline that can run well on, in the cloud, let's run in the cloud. And what I mean here is the fact that we need to combine both to, com to, have, uh, to reduce the power consumption. And the question that I usually receive is, okay, this is absolutely uh, interesting, but how difficult is it? It's not difficult at all. As I said, in particular on the ARM CPU, The, on the on the ARM CPU, what we can guarantee is actually uh, actually the performance portability, okay, from mobile. So something that you write on mobile, or you optimize on mobile, sorry, can run well also in the cloud. And we're going also to I'm going also to present some numbers later. The other important area is about the investment in in, in adding features in the architecture to improve the performance, but also addressing the, uh, to, you know, and try also to uh, minimize or reduce the power consumption. And this is in the DNA of ARM. It's not because of Gen AI. I mean, we have started this already when we saw deep learning coming in 2014, and we have started integrating features and features to improve the performance, but also improve the power efficiency. We have started, for instance, with the, I mean, with the, we knew with the dot product instruction for 8-bit computation. After that, we introduced the BF16 data type, another crucial data type for, uh, for AI workloads. After that, we had introduced the MMLA instruction to accelerate even further matrix multiplication routines. And now we, we have the SP, the scalable vector um, engine, and also the uh, SME um, uh, on the ARM V9. So as you can see, something that we have in the DNA since uh, the very beginning. And it is because of this continuous innovation in this area that we are able to see this Gen AI running on ARM uh, today. Both in the cloud, and these are some of the uh, performance or the improvements in terms of energy efficiency, so compared to the previous generation. So as you can see on the AWS Graviton, 60% more energy efficient, on the Google Avian, 60% more energy efficient, and also for the Microsoft Cobalt and for the NVIDIA uh, Grace uh, uh, Blackwell. This is because of the continuous innovation in this area. But what about mobile? Well, we have seen some demos earlier. And if we have these demos, it's because of some of the instructions that we have, um, uh, we have put in the hardware for, uh, for AI already for deep learning that are also applicable for the Gen AI space. And here there is an, um, a list of sizes of large language models uh, of, open, um, of open large language models that we have uh, nowadays. Some of them, uh, not all of them can run certainly in the cloud. Some of them at the top can only run in the cloud because of the memory constraint. That, there is no way we can run on mobile. But there is an interesting sweet spot where we can run well on mobile. We can run well on mobile because of the um, technology that we have, but also because of the software ecosystem that goes together. Software plus hardware. This is the reason why we, have, we are able to run it, uh, to have uh, LLMs today running on mobile. And to stress this point, I like to give you a very simple example, which is about the 4-bit quantizations, because I mentioned the instructions are crucial, but we need the software. And the software is actually what enables these LLMs on uh, mobile. But sometimes, um, sometimes it's, it's difficult for developers to identify the, 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 a, a, common, a common technique to solve the, 
um, the problem for accelerating these models on mobile. Let me give you, let me give, um, let me go back to the uh, 2014. When we were talking about VGG16 at that time, you can see this model, a large model, we solved this problem with quantization, 8-bit quantization in particular. Now we have a similar problem, but the 8-bit quantization is not enough. And what the community um, uh, prepare, what, uh, what um, has been a collection of uh, techniques to go lower than 8-bit on a full bit. And the two, one, two main ones are certainly the per-channel quantization and the per-block quantization. The only difference is on the how you quantize the data. So if you consider an array, uh, when you have per-channel, you take the full array and you use one scale factor and one offset, depending on if you have the offset for the entire uh, array. When you have per-block, you take your array, you split the array in multiple chunks, which are of fixed size, the block in this case, and you have the scale and optionally the offset for each, for each block. Which one is the best? We don't know. Or probably you know if you are designing your models because you have the data, of course, to assess these. So software is certainly crucial. But one question you might ask is about, okay, but if you need to maintain all these uh, optimizations, it could be quite, quite painful because we might have um, an infinite number of solutions, right? So if we need to do it for the cloud and for the edge, how many implementations do we need? As I said earlier, since we are not talking about code portability, but we are talking about performance portability, optimization portabilities, we can optimize once and deploy everywhere. And this is what we have done, for instance, with the per-channel quantization that we have uh, optimized for mobile and we have deployed on in PyTorch, or something that we are doing with a per-block quantization as well. And this actually also brings me to the products and the program, the Clyde, the Clyde project. Clyde in Greek means key. This is the key for enabling AI everywhere on ARM. And Clyde is not just a library. Clyde is also the collection of supporting materials, tutorials, in order to help developers to understand how to deploy models on mobile and in the cloud, but also um, to understand how to integrate our software in the AI frameworks. And these are the two latest software libraries that we have developed recently. One is Clyde CV with the uh, critical routines for uh, computer vision, for, for classic computer vision. And the other one is Clyde AI that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, an open source project that contains the critical ops for AI workloads. And to wrap up, these are the performance improvement that we have seen with Clyde AI by integrating Clyde AI in PyTorch and Clyde AI in, um, in Executorch. More than two, uh, 12x better performance and around 20% performance improvement on Executorch. What do we need to do? Nothing, because this will be integrated in both PyTorch and Executorch, so no dependencies. So to close this presentation, uh, this is just a recap. We have seen how important is the power efficiency for, from cloud to edge. We have mentioned about the PyTorch and Executorch performance improvements with an important collaboration with, uh, with Meta and then the important role to optimize once and deploy anywhere. So if you haven't joined yet the, um, the developer program, please join us. There are already more than 12,000 members and we have also ambassadors and the one that we have here is from Meta, is the Gantt. 
software engineer at Meta. And to close this presentation, it doesn't stop here, so please stop at the booth to ask as many questions as you want, but also I really recommend to, uh, to join the lightning talk uh, at uh, 11.50 from Parina, who is gonna talk about how, empower, how to empower developers with tools to enable generative AI on ARM CPUs. Thanks a lot, everyone.